This episode is brought to you by EFG Holding, a trailblazing financial institution with a universal bank in Egypt and the leading investment bank in the Middle East and North Africa. You are now known, of course, as uh, somebody who uh, pioneered, for better or for worse, in terms of wording, the the concept of sustainability and development in Egypt and in the wider region. How did this come to you as a young man, as a possible direction in life, as something that you wanted to explore and develop and study in great detail. How did that evolve into becoming your focus? Also engineering based. In chemical engineering. And uh, at the time I was finishing my lab work, I used to spend late nights in the laboratory. Uh, I began thinking, what will I do after I get my doctorate mm. in chemical engineering? Mm. And for me, uh, all I could see is choices that I didn't feel comfortable with. I wasn't about to teach in university because I'm not a teacher. And quite frankly, if you speak about uh, a year of resistance to sit with you in this interview, it's because I really try and shy away from any kind of public appearances. So can you imagine having to go and lecture? In Every crowds? day in uh, an it's, auditorium. It's for, me, it's for me difficult. Yes. It's not an easy... Uh, You're not comfortable no, in, in that no, way. I'm not, I'm not comfortable as a public speaker. Yes. Or as a, so uh, teaching was not a choice. Then working for a research institution was not a choice. I didn't want to spend my life in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Working for a, a, sorry to say that, not nothing wrong with the oil industry or the chemical industry, but it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see a career path. So at that time, I lived in New York and uh, uh, I wanted to have my own apartment. Uh, I lived in downtown Manhattan. And to be able to afford uh, my uh, apartment, I had to work. Uh, and I responded, I had responded throughout my graduate studies in New York, I responded to an advert uh, by a blind professor, Professor Helmut Schutz. And uh, uh, the advert, uh, the professor needed uh, someone to be his eyes. He had lost his eyesight in the laboratory. He was a brilliant uh, scientist. Uh, actually, I owe him uh, the larger part of my education because spending time with him, reading his papers, uh, 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 having him edit what I would re uh, read to him, uh, going through uh, this cycle on a daily mm -hmm. basis for a few hours a day was uh, the best of possible educations mm -hmm. I would I would have, could have gotten in the realm of science. Anyway, when I had this phobia, I went to Professor Schultz and I said, Professor Schultz, I don't think I want to continue in uh, uh, with my uh, degree. Uh, and he uh, said why, I expressed to him why, the same manner I expressed it to you. And uh, he said, listen, you've invested a lot in your education. And I had, because uh, I spent a lot of time, in, I did spend a long time in school. And it was also a time where it was difficult for people from Egypt to go to the U.S. for education. Correct. When I had this conversation with Professor Schultz, he said that you've made a big investment in, in this in, in science and it would be a pity uh to lose it all now let me think about it that's what he said a week or so later he said munir how about environment hmm. and i said but there is no environmental program in the university and it was him who hit that spot when he said uh, how about environment i could feel light in my entire existence. How interesting, Munir. 
And, and it, it was as if I saw the trajectory of my life. You know what's interesting as well, because at the time, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't a discipline, was it? No, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. wasn't. I had to be shuttled from different schools, be it urban planning, public yes. health. Uh, you know, I just went through what you would call a multidisciplinary yes. program. Yes. It was, they were hard pressed to find me a thesis topic. We found a thesis topic. I finished and I got. That's fascinating. Yeah. It, it was, this is why I mentioned that this man, mm. uh, 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 the, uh, Professor Schultz and Mr. Bubbles and my parents, friends, so on. Life is a mixture of blessings. And luck, uh, right? And luck. And a lot of serendipity because he was already in your world, but he came up with an answer that you hadn't considered. Exactly, exactly, yes. I was lost. Exactly. I was lost, it was. It's fascinating it was, how that happens. Uh, and it was instant. Yeah. I mean. The light bulb went off for you. Yes, and, and you know, when you come to think about it, he thought about it profoundly. And this is really a big lesson in life. You should always not just think of yourself. You mm -hmm. should always think of others. Absolutely. And he thought, what does this, he thought this young man that has been working with me for so long, you know, I need mm -hmm. to help him. And he gave it a lot of thought. And this is probably the initiation of my adulthood. Of course. So you returned to Egypt. Did you immediately begin your uh, company EQI? Was that something you started immediately? Yes, I did. And tell me about that. What was the, the thinking behind EQI? Look, EQI stands for Environmental Quality International. Uh, uh, I was, since I'm the founder, I guess I chose the name. Uh, the name was chosen intentionally to uh, coin some of the important things that I thought should guide my evolution. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it speaks for itself, environment, quality, and international, you know. The, uh, the uh, first venture mm. into establishing this company, because I didn't have, uh, uh, I had very little money, Although I came from, uh, my father was a very wealthy man, but circumstances had yes. that uh, without a father, uh, you were starting road, on your own, starting completely on my own. Uh, the logical thing to start with was the provision of advisory services. It didn't require any investment. That's right. It just required thought. So it's a consultancy at the beginning. Exactly. Advisory services. Yes. And the first initiative, and you spoke about luck, you know, the saying that goes a square meter of luck rather than a hectare of competence. Well, I didn't know that expression. Well, uh, yeah. it's an Egyptian saying. Yes. So, uh, uh, the first project we landed was coincided with the first urban development initiative investment uh, between the Egyptian government and the World Bank. Uh, it was in fact called the first Egypt urban development project. Mm -hmm. And that first Egypt development project had in it a component to upgrade the Manshayit Nasser main settlement. It was the first community upgrading initiative to be launched in Egypt. Of course, the World Bank had engaged in others elsewhere in the world, and they yes. thought that this would be worthwhile for mm -hmm. Egypt because this was the beginning of the expansion of informality. Informal yes, settlements. The informal were, settlements. Exactly. Yes. And this was one of the, one of the ways to uh, basically deal with mm -hmm. this trend. Now, uh, uh, the first Egypt urban development project was, as I said, in Manshayit Nasser, next to the main settlement in Manshayit Nasser, which is huge, 
was a smaller settlement where the garbage collectors of Cairo resided, the yes. Zabalin The Zabalin area, yes. So we managed to tag on the Zabalin settlement and the uh, EQI was charged with the upgrading of the Zabalin settlement. And that was the first important, you mentioned about transitions like yes. the first important initiative we undertook. It's also a milestone project in Egypt in its own right. Correct, correct. And we, uh, over the years, over the first, I should say, 10 years of our existence, I'm speaking now late 70s until uh, mid, mid to late 80s, uh, EQI was so heavily engaged. We had expanded the, uh, the tapestry of partnerships to include the Ford Foundation, Oxfam, and of course the Egyptian government. Mm -hmm. the, the Cairo governor, it was uh, omnipresent throughout. But we then literally mastered the art of creating partnerships. Mm. In the mid 80s, the Ford Foundation, which we managed to engage to help with the community development end of the initiative, organized a round table in which they invited uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus mm -hmm. from Bangladesh. Yes. They had a program with him with the Grameen Bank. Yes. And they invited him to come to Egypt in this round table to look at what we were doing at the Zabalin and for the, us to learn what he was doing in Bangladesh mm -hmm. in the domain of microfinance. And uh, in around this round table, we got introduced to that dimension, which was for us non-existent. We didn't know anything about it. We then, after Muhammad, Professor Yunus left, we then tested all the hypotheses he had, all the uh, elements of uh, how important microfinance is, all his uh, views on microfinance. We tested them, and because this is in microfinance, deals with the huge market of poverty, mm -hmm. poor people. Of this course. is the, the this is the landscape, and we were. At the forefront uh, of that. We were in the Zabelin settlement. We were in Manchayat Nasser. We could test all the uh, instruments. And that you already had, had the trust of the people there. Exactly. Which yeah. is a huge, exactly. a huge part of it. Exactly. Yes. And uh, uh, everything that Professor Yunus said, in, and the most important of which is that the poor are credit worthy was verified. And as a result of that, EQI entered into the microfinance domain. So environment, microfinance, different disciplines, professionals with capabilities. It was a, a very, very powerful uh, repository of knowledge in the domain of sustainable living. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll go on now to your uh, love and um, life in Siwa. Um, you started off there, I think you went on your first trip in 1996, and you fell in love with the place. I'd like to understand how that evolved into you seeing the potential to help the community there and how it evolved into the idea of trying to do things in an ecologically friendly manner there in terms of the developments that you you created there. Explain to me a little bit what Siwa was when you first went in terms of what it meant to you and why you saw potential there. As I mentioned earlier, we were providing advisory. We're in the domain of provision of advisory services. Knowledge was there, mm -hmm. capabilities, staff capabilities were there, but boredom found its way in my life. As you grow, you no longer are master of your own destiny. So in the domain of advisory services, I found that EQI was competing for 
project mm -hmm. was responding to the desires of others to the point where the relationship between me and myself was disturbed. I felt we were losing our path. Did and you feel, sorry, Munir, I want to press you on this point. Is it because you were no longer involved in the day-to-day -day of the business or because the company had grown and you had too many projects running at the same time? It's because the company had grown and I, the top priority was to ensure that the company was healthy. Of course. And that people were paid. Yeah. And uh, uh, you, you be I began losing sight of why I am mm -hmm. in the domain of sustainable living. It became a business. It, it became in a the business wrong, which yeah. I did not want to do. Yes, yes. So I didn't want to literally be working mm -hmm. to realize the desires of others. I understand. So uh, I had a mission mm -hmm. that grew and evolved in my life that I wanted to uh, realize, mm -hmm. I said. So uh, at that point in time, I said to myself and shared with my colleagues, if there is any value in the advice we're giving, then we should be invested in it. Hmm. It's not just talking about yes. it. And uh, I was looking for a place where the concept of sustainable living could literally uh, be seeded and could grow because I believed this for me was like a religion. I believed that if you establish solid relationships with your natural and physical environment, solid relationships with communities, and if you establish solid relationships with your past, present, and future, you appreciate your heritage. Mm -hmm. That together these are formulas for creating magical results. You can literally combat a lot of the social problems and create a lot of opportunities for entire communities. And I posed, I, I began looking for a place to begin doing that. And quite frankly, I was looking at the Sinai. I was looking at the West Coast of the Red Sea. That's where everybody was heading. Yes. We're talking about the mid nineties now. Yes. And in a meeting, a young anthropologist who had been working in Siwa with us, we had some small initiatives in mm -hmm. Siwa mm -hmm. in the early eighties, mm -hmm. mentioned Siwa. And immediately, just like the story with Professor oh, Schultz, uh, I said, Siwa, a fragile ecosystem right in the middle of the desert with a parallel existence. I hadn't been to Siwa, but uh, immediately I knew about Siwa. It's so, interesting how your instinct and your gut has guided you along the way. You felt it and you knew that this was a, a good direction it, for you. It, it was instant. Yeah. And that when Naila mentioned mm. Siwa, mm. Uh, a few weeks later, I had a whole mission assembled and we went to Siwa, traveled uh, the desert. And uh, when I got there, it was uh, arriving there. I was, uh, I began about 30, 40 kilometers from Siwa, began looking at uh, uh, Herodotus' writings, the histories, two volumes. I knew Herodotus had traveled to Siwa yes. and began looking at the passages that, related, the to that Siwa. related to Siwa. I had finished finding the passages and reading them when we just went through the curve and entered Siwa. And two things caught my eye. The flat-topped white mountain at Raramillal and the old town, the old fortress of Shali. And it was instant again, 
that if we were ever to engage in Syria, we're going to have to be engaged in these two areas. And we did. Mm -hmm. So the journey was, uh, again, uh, 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 a chance uh, uh, occurrence. Uh, the rewards were immense. Uh, uh, if I may say that some of the most beautiful years of my life uh, was in this cycle of engagement, which continues to this day. So uninterrupted and without reserve. I read somewhere it took you 15 years approximately to get it up and running in terms of what we see today. Is that is that the case? Or? Uh, look, let me just... Uh, uh, underscore a very important belief that I have. You initiate actions, but actions have a life of their own. As long as I am living, my engagement will continue. And what you, what we started some 27, 20 years ago, or some 30 years ago, will evolve evolve slowly but surely hopefully in the right direction being slow is very important not rushing things is very important especially when you deal with issues of life and work and the relationship between humans yes and their surrounding environment if you rush it, you can fall flat on your face. We should not projectize our existence. It's a very good we point. We should always be looking around us because always listening around us because with every step we take, there are echoes. And it is that discerning eye and that uh, desire to see and listen and capture what's around you that guides you to the next stage and we've been going through this exercise uh, we've had i've had personally the privilege to go through this exercise in siwa and uh, if i can take it elsewhere uh, i certainly will but the story of siwa is not finished yet it hasn't yet reached what i would call a stage where it can be a lighthouse mm -hmm. or a good example of sustainable living. There's more to do. And in getting it done, we need to work more on establishing new partnerships uh, with public institutions, with other private institutions, with research institutions. And this is what I am preoccupied with now. Mm, mm. You're 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 trying to plan for the future of Siwa. Look, uh, uh, Malak, as much as you can, Malak. Uh, nothing is done by one man. No, of or course, one woman. Of course. The big lesson I've learned in my life is to be always thinking of the other as I engage mm -hmm. in whatever I do uh, because it is in this co-creation that you great value is uh, created. The big problem that faces a lot of initiatives or that uh, that stands in the way of a lot of initiatives is the lack of recognition of the importance of sharing, of engaging uh, others. And I mean, from the smallest to the largest, from the most ignorant to the most knowledgeable, you have to be always uh, uh, ready to capture mm -hmm. whatever comes your way to and be able to have the courage to change course when it's necessary to yes. change course yes. otherwise 
Otherwise, you fall into the trap of your ego being superimposed on the natural environment. When you work with nature, it's another story. You have to be listening to nature because in nature, there is the biggest wealth mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And it is not just about digging it out. It's about finding it and harnessing it mm -hmm. and being and creating a communion between you and your surrounding environment. We've, we're trying our best to do this in Syria.